Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, thanks for starting half an hour later today. This is, uh, with two young kids at home, this is actually the most, the, the latest uh, I've slept in a long time. So that's <laughs> great. Um, if you think back 20 years, um, machine learning has really been incredibly successful. Now, 20 years ago, maybe machine learning was used somewhere in the back end, uh, checking your credit card transactions to whether they're fraudulent or not. And if you fast forward to today, machine learning has become this very user-facing <coughs> technology, right? There are all of these websites where machine learning is really the key differentiator that makes them work, right? If you think about uh, like recommendation companies like Netflix, right? It's really what differentiates them, what makes the user interface, is the machine learning algorithm. <coughs> Search engines use machine learning to you know, constantly monitor and update their retrieval function. Um, and uh, you know, we're starting to see machine learning in our home regulating the temperature. Um, and there's going to be many more applications that are really close to the way that we live. Like, we're going to have these types of robots. So machine learning has become this technology that constantly interacts with the user. And, um, what I want to focus on in this talk is thinking about this loop of interaction between the human user and the machine learning system, and how should we should start. So, on an abstract level, this is what this loop looks like, right? We have a machine learning algorithm on the one side. The machine learning algorithm makes some predictions to the user. That could be like a ranking in response to a query. So throughout this talk, I'll often use search engines as my kind of running example. But the same applies to all kinds of other machine learning applications. So the algorithm makes a prediction why, uh, based on some context types, um, that the user supplied. The user re reacts to this uh, by you know, using the results for some purpose. And search engine maybe find a piece of information. <coughs> and um, the thing that the algorithm can observe is where the user clicks, reformulates the query, all kinds of things like that. So we have this loop of interaction between user and algorithm that is never ending. And where over time we would hope that um, the utility of that the, the certain, the, what the algorithm provides to the user, um, and utility in a loose sense right now, um, improves. Okay? This, you know, this interaction gets better and the, the learning algorithm serves the user. So, this type of loop is what I want to analyze in this talk. And I want to make three points about this loop. Um, oh, let me first characterize these two, um, these two blobs a little bit more. So what makes this problem interesting, it's not interesting from a game theory point of view. What makes it interesting is that these two agents are actually constrained. The algorithm has incomplete knowledge of what the user wants um, and wants to augment this knowledge. The user I have computational constraints. So the user wants the algorithm to solve some of the computation for it, right? So for example, the user cannot look through every web page and, and evaluate it. Like and at this interplay, I think that makes these, these learning problems interesting. So I want to make three points about these learning problems. The first one is that taking the data that we observe, things like clicks, query reformulations, it looks tempting, you know, these are XY pairs in some sense. You know, using them directly as training data is not the right way to go. And I'm going to present a couple of examples where, you know, it, it's really not, um, not right to use this observed data in a naive way. Um, I would argue that what we're observing are the user's decisions, and that these decisions don't make sense without a good model of how the user makes decisions. So what I think we should be doing instead is, from these observed decisions, the decision to click on a link, or the decision to reformulate a query, what we really need is we need a good model of how the user came to that decision. And only then can we interpret it as feedback. And once we have that, whatever feedback we can get, that's how we design the learning algorithm. So that there are these two steps in this design. Okay, let me start with the first point. The observed data is not directly trained. And to illustrate this, this is the very simplest learning problem that you could have for a search engine. 
you have two retrieval functions, and you have a distribution of users, and you just want to decide which one is better. <coughs> so, for example, use a random query, uh, TJ issuing the query SVM. And uh, retrieval function one produces this ranking, and this ranking has a certain utility um, to, the, to that user. And uh, retrieval function two produces this ranking, has a certain other utility to this user. Now, the simple question is which retrieval function on average produces better results? So what we need is we need to some way of you know, measuring utility, measuring performance. Right? Utility, in this sense, just a performance <coughs> measure. So one thing that we could do is we could look at observable statistics, like you know, how many people, how often does a query get abandoned? No click on anything. Right? And we would think if the retrieval quality, if utility goes down, then abandonment rate goes up. We could look at the, how many queries get reformulated, how many clicks do we have per query, you know, more clicks means more good results, maybe, right? So we would expect the, uh, that to correlate with this utility, maybe. Maybe we don't know which direction, but at least it should very monotonically respond. And other things as well, maybe the ranks of the clicks, how many clicks I get on the first result that I present, things like that. So let's see if any of these statistics actually give us information about the utility that the, uh, that the system provides. So to get at this question, we implemented a search engine for uh, archive work. It's this repository of scientific papers. People in physics use it all the time. In CS, I think it's getting more, um, more popular as well. So with the search engine, we have a nice distribution of users. Um, and um, what we need now is we need retrieval functions where we know which one is better. Right? And so what we did is we came up with a retrieval function where we had different weights for different fields, like different weights for title matches and author matches and full text matches and things like that. And that's our original retrieval function. And we didn't know how to make this any better, but we knew how to make it reliably worse. So what we did was we took two links from the top five and replaced them from the, with the bottom five. Two random ones. And under very mild assumptions, this is the worst ranking. And we could make it even further worse by swapping four. So what this gives us is this ordering of retrieval function where original is best, swap two is slightly worse, and swap four is even worse. So we know by construction what the right kind of order by utility is. And we did this another time. I uh, took the original retrieval function, threw away the field weights, that's flat, I made it worse. And then we took the results from flat and, um, and randomized the order of the top ten and made it even worse. That's right. So we now have two triples where we know the two ordered by one. Now we took this retrieval function, fielded them on our search engine, <coughs> and you know a certain bucket of users got this retrieval function, certain bucket of that, and we made sure that there are you know, no biases and set things up correctly. And here are the results. So on the x-axis here, we have the different statistics that we measure. And the y-axis is the value for statistics, and the blue bars is the first triple, and the red bars is the second triple. And these little whispers on top here, they show um, how we expected or hypothesized this metric would change. And if you look at this graph, they don't. Right? Actually, none of these metrics reflects the known ordering by quality. Well, if you look closer at the data, it's actually that many of these differences between the metrics are not statistically significant. So this was about 4,000 queries for each retrieval function. Well, it's not a big amount, right? So maybe if we had lots more data, you know, everything would work out fine. So Olivier Chappelle at Google, uh, sorry, at Yahoo, did uh, the same study, but on Yahoo web search, but uh, not using 4,000 queries, but tens of millions of queries for each retrieval. And so, so there are four retrieval functions, and they were expert judged according to which one was better. And uh, we used uh, DCG um, at five as the true order. Um, so, yeah, uh, yeah, we didn't want to release like the absolute value. So these are just differences between retrieval function pairs. So, for example, uh, this is the difference in the statistic between retrieval function A and retrieval function B. And it's ordered in a way here so that uh, it, um, this, the statistic should be positive 
if the direction it predicts the retrieval quality changes is uh, correct. So if you look at this again, um, actually the only function or the only metric that changes correctly with retrieval quality is clicks at one. So the fraction of clicks at the first result is <coughs> satisfying. That nothing under the first result matters. But you know, even even there, this difference here between A and B after tens of millions of queries is not statistically significant. So at the very best, these differences are tiny, right? So that doesn't really seem to work. Right? So maybe we should just ask users straight up. We should just ask them questions and they <coughs> ask for explicit feedback. And here's an example where um, this actually seems to work. So people um, do answer this question. Uh, on Amazon, uh, was this review helpful to you? Yes or no? It's a simple question, right? And has a simple answer, yes or no. Uh, you would expect that people actually answer this question. They don't. <coughs> well, they do answer the question, but what you observe is not actually what you would think you would get. So what we did is we tracked 500 products of Amazon and their reviews over more than half a year and uh, recorded uh, kind of how they accumulated these helpful results. And uh, skipping over a lot of details of the study, here's one of the results that you have. Um, on the axis, axis here, you have where the result or where the review in the ranking should actually be positioned. It kind of it's true rank by quality. And on the y-axis, you have where the result, where the review was actually presented. And the colors here indicate the polarity of the vote. Red means uh, high probability of clicking yes. Uh, kind of bluish means high probability of clicking no. And you can see this diagonal shape here. Basically saying, if you take a review and you present it too high, then it will get predominantly no votes. If you present it too low, it will get predominantly yes votes. So what people are doing is they're not answering the question, was this review helpful to you? What they're really doing is they're telling you this should be ranked higher or this should be ranked lower. So you're actually observing here the result of a decision that's not necessarily the answer to the question. And also for participation, um, same axis here. And now the color indicates when do people actually give feedback. And on the diagonal, you see if something is roughly correctly ranked, people don't give feedback. If it's away from the correct rank, people start giving feedback. If you wanted to design the optimal algorithm for ranking reviews, then you should do it with this kind of behavior in mind. So even for explicit feedback, um, what you're observing is the result of a user's decision process. And it's not necessarily this ground truth label that you think you need. In particular, the observed ratios that you see, you know, the, how many people found a review helpful, is not an absolute measure of quality. It's just the result of this kind of equilibrium in this game. Right? This absolute number doesn't necessarily have a meaning. Okay. <coughs> So I've given you two examples where using the observed data without thinking about the decision process that led to the data um, is probably not good to trade data. So what should we do instead? So I argue what we need to do, we actually have to model the user's decision process. And then from that model, we can derive feedback. And once we have a good feedback model, then we can design the right algorithm for and that typically requires us to actually design the algorithms, which is nice for our machine learning. But let me ask with the first, uh, start with the first process here, um, modeling the user's decision process. Um, so get, let's go back to this uh, you know, simple learning problem, just deciding which ranking function is better. <coughs> and so we have to come up with a model of how people click. 
And to do that, let's, let me give you one slight introduction to kind of microeconomic uh, decision theory. <coughs> um, so the, the, the very basic standard model of, uh, um, of decision theory is that of rational choice. Uh, in a descriptive way, this means that um, if I give a person a set of Y alternatives, what they will do is they will pick the one that's most preferred. And you can model that through a utility function and say that you know, the user has to evaluate each item in the, um, in the set of alternatives and scores it and then picks the one that has the highest utility. <coughs> so this is the basis for most theory, in, uh, in, in most economic theory, right, and game theory. Um, now that doesn't <coughs> quite capture what people are doing in web search. They clearly don't evaluate all of the alternatives, right? They could go down all the way, you know, down to a result one billion, and think about and pick the best one. That's clearly not what people are doing. So what bounded rationality models say <coughs> is that well, people actually make these decisions among alternatives under constraints. So for example, time constraints, right? I want to make the you know I want to find something under a certain time constraint budget. Or computation constraints. You know, how much time am I actually going to spend reading these uh, these abstract and really figuring out what the utility function is? So I may be operating under the proxy. So clearly, what people are doing in, in using online systems is this kind of bounded rationality model. It satisfies um, uh, you know quality for how quickly they can find something. And th those are the types of models we're going to use in this talk. So more, you know, behavioral economics then goes even further and fixes some of the kind of observed problems with bounded rationality models. For example, things like framing. You know, whatever you make the default is going to be the most popular choice. Right? This is outside of this utility model. You can't model it as utility. But, um, uh, you know, there are these other factors that influence decisions. Things like fairness. And I think fairness is maybe one of the explanations why people act the way for these review rankings. You know, they find it unfair that a certain view is not in the right spot. Right? Okay, these bounded rationality models, how could we apply this to users in web search? Well, in a simple model, uh, we could say what people do is they explore the top K, they decide to stop at some point, you know, when their time budget runs out, and then they click on the most relevant link, the highest utility link in, among the ones that they observe. There's actually empirical support for, you know, for eye-tracking studies that that's what people do. And then they would go on, maybe explore some more, do another click, or reformulate the query, but, you know, we're, we're not going to want that for now. Now, if this is our model of user behavior, how should we set up this pairwise comparison between the two functions? We should set it up so that the user's choices as a utility maximizer tell us something about the relative quality of the two utility functions. So we have to set it up as, as a choice problem in the appropriate way. It's called balance consumption. We have the two rankings, one produced by retrieval function one, one produced by retrieval function two. But what you present to the user is an interleaving of these two rankings. So uh, there's a particular way of interleaving these two rankings so that at every cutoff point in the interleaved ranking, and that's the only thing that the user sees, the user has seen as many results from the top k of retrieval function 1 and the top k from retrieval function 2, plus minus 1. So in this sense, it's fair. There are equally many opportunities, roughly, uh, for a click. And now we can observe how the user clicks here. And if the user is a utility maximizer, they will click on the most useful links. So let's say the user clicked on these links. We can now trace back where they came from. So three links came from retrieval function two, the top k there, and only one came from the top four of retrieval function one. And here we would say, okay, the overall preference of the user would have been to see this ranking over that, <coughs> just because it has more of these highly relevant links. Now this is a leap kind of in, in interpreting going from individual utilities of documents to the utility of ranking, which for balance interleaving is a bit of a leap. Um, but there is actually other words by Rodinsky and Craswell, and actually there was a uh, very nice PhD thesis by um, Katja Hoffman from Amsterdam that actually really studied how we build these interleaving algorithms. So what this gives us now, we've set up the choice problem in a way that tells us something about 
the relative preference between the two rankings. So now, over the distribution of queries, we can ask about which ranking function wins more often. Right? So what we did was we took all the different pairs of ranking functions from our triplets, the original is better than stack 2, stack 4, and the other triplet, and fielded them on archive. So we interleave these, each of these pairs. A certain bucket of users got to see this, these interleavings. Um, and, uh, then we looked at what's the win-loss ratio um, for our uh, archive or our archive searcher. <coughs> and here are the results again. So these are the different pairs that we're comparing. And I've always arranged it so that the better pair by construction is on the left, and its win ratio is shown in red. And the worst pair is on the right, and its win ratio is shown in blue. So in all cases, the better retrieval function wins more often than the worse retrieval function. And actually, all of these differences are significant, even for our small archive data. So unlike for these kind of naive measures, like abandonment grade, this becomes very reliable, even for small amounts of data. And I can say, well, I mean, these differences are huge between the retrieval functions, right? What if you have more nuanced differences? So here are two studies, one for Yahoo Web Search, same study by uh, Chappelle, and, um, and uh, for Bing Web Search by Ladinsky and Pascal, where they basically did the same experiment that I just described. And even though the differences in retrieval quality were much smaller here, um, again, these interleaving techniques exactly reflected the uh, ordering that they got through very expensive manual evaluation of these retrieval functions. So basically through this setup here, you can get the same results as you would get by paying a lot of human assessors to rate links on the web and, um, uh, and do the kind of standard um, you know, search engine evaluation. <coughs> okay, so we've solved our first problem in one case. So we've defined a decision process, a model of the user's decision process, and then derived uh, a way to extract feedback based on this decision model. And I think one of the interesting things about working in this interactive systems is that the algorithm actually has complete control over what it presents to the user. It can run these interactive experiments. It can do things like interleaving. It can be very creative in how it extracts information from the user. It's not a passive observer, but it actually runs these interactive experiments. That gives you a huge design space to work in. Now, our new abstraction now is, okay, we have this pairwise comparison test that if A is better than B, there's going to be this preference. How do we design a learning algorithm, given that we have this, pair, this uh, pairwise comparison test? So, now, we don't want to compare just two or two functions, but let's say we have four. And um, A is the best one, it's slightly better than B, and it's a lot better than C and D. So we have 10 different pairs, pairwise comparisons that we could make, but they have different costs. Right? So A and B, you know, presenting that interleaving to the user, that doesn't have much cost, right? They're both good retrieval functions. If you interleave them, that's fine, right? If you take uh, A and C, well, that has a bit higher cost, because like, every second result is bad in the interleaving. If you leave C and D, that's bad, right? Because you interleave two bad rankings and you know, the user just gets bad stuff. On the other hand, if you interleave A and A, that's zero cost to the user. It's the best thing that you can do, that you know how to do. So now, a learning algorithm, we have to figure out which sequence of you know, pairwise comparisons to make so that eventually you arrive at the conclusion A is the best. And in the process, you don't annoy the users, right? It has low cost. And that's what we call the dual bandwidth problem. You can think about this as a kind of a traditional bandwidth algorithm, but um, if you know bandwidth algorithms, but that the only thing that you can observe is you can pull two levers at the same time. And you don't get cardinal feedback, but just get feedback this paid off more than this. So how do we define a duet in, the, in this dual bandwidth problem? So let's say we have K retrieval functions, F B, F1 being the best and Fk being the worst. Uh, then, and we have this pairwise comparison test. Then regret is defined 
by looking at the probabilities of losing against the best. So if I do a pairwise comparison between f and f prime, and my best retrieval function f star here is, uh, in this case it would be f1, then I sum up the probabilities that the rankings that I present lose against the best retrieval function. So it's kind of difficult to explain, so let me do it with an example. So let's say in the first iteration I ask for a comparison between f9 and f12. F9 has a probability of 90%, it's a pretty bad one, of losing against the uh, uh, pairwise comparison against the best retriever function. So we would add 0.9 to the loss in this iteration. F12 has a probability of 95% of losing against the best one um, for a random query. Uh, so we add another 0.95, and then we subtract 1 just to kind of normalize it to 0 because 0.5 and 0.5 is the best thing. <coughs> so the loss in this iteration would be 0.85. And hopefully over time, we only interleave good retrieval functions, right, so that the loss in each iteration becomes small. The regret is now the sum of all of these losses, and we would hope that this converges to zero fast. So we're characterizing the overall behavior of the system throughout its lifetime. So the first thought for an algorithm that we had was, well, we do some kind of tournament, right? Tournaments are great at identifying winners. And there's prior work on you know, uh, noisy max and noisy sorting algorithms. But tournaments actually don't work for our case, because tournaments don't, they optimize the probability of getting a winner, but they don't optimize regret. So for example, you know, they may be playing really bad players against each other very often, which is something you don't want to do. Here's something that does work. Uh, here's an algorithm that's called interleaf filter. Um, and I want to read the algorithm, but I then want to explain it with an example. Let's say we have five functions that we want to compare, f1 being the best, f5 being the worst. We start by picking a random function, and let's call this our incumbent. And then what we do is we go round robin and do pairwise comparisons between this incumbent and all of the others. Until one of two things happens. The first thing that can happen is that one of the other functions become significantly worse. So, for example, here at 5, uh, out of 10 games, lost 9 times. So we have some significant threshold that says, okay, this one is definitely worse. <laughs> so we can you know, throw it out, we we'll never consider it again. And then we keep going, playing round robin, the incumbent against all the other ones. Until another thing could happen. So for example, one other retrieval function, or one other function, could become significantly better and what we know then is that, well, our old incumbent can't be the best one, right? So we can kick that one out. And we can actually kick out this one or any other function that lost more often than it won against the old incumbent. That's not entirely obvious, <coughs> but trust me on that one. Um, so we can kick that one out as well. And then we just keep playing another round with a new incumbent and keep going like that until we have just one left. So a very simple algorithm. So what can be proof about this algorithm? Well, you have to make some assumptions that you know, these pairwise comparison tests aren't crazy. Uh, for example, that they don't have cycles in them. You know, A is better than B, B is better than C, and then C is better than A. Right? That would, again, you, know, you have to assume some rationality of the user. Um, actually, in real experiments, I've never seen this kind of cyclic behavior. You can construct, definitely can construct people acting simply, but uh, in the real world experiments, I haven't seen it. And that's basically what the, all of these complicated things say in a, you know, in a probabilistic extension. So if you're willing to make these assumptions, you get a regret bound that looks like this. Um, it basically says that this probability regret here is upper bounded by something that's linear in the number of functions that you're comparing. So it's not you know, you could have thought initially that, you know, because you do this pairwise comparison, that you have to do k square comparisons if you have k functions. No, you don't. Right? It's linear. So, kind of asymptotically, it's just as expensive as just evaluating this function independently and getting a score. And the regret goes to zero at a pretty fast rate, log t over t. Um, you can actually show that this is the best possible. So, there's information theoretic global bound that 
that matches that algorithm. Okay. So this was the first example of really making a you know a chain of function k function that it knew. And kind of in principle, any learning algorithm, um, you know, basically does random exploration. You know, you can put some prior information in there, and then you know the randomness kind of becomes proportional to the entropy in that distribution. But still, you're doing random exploration. Now, can we take this task of doing exploration from the learning algorithm and you know, asking the user to do it? I think people are actually much better at exploration, and they're actually doing a different type of exploration. But let me give you an example. This is my Netflix page, as of a couple of days ago. And so, so what Netflix, it gives me my recommendations down here. And Netflix thinks that I want to watch Lewis Black. Now, the, the way that I typically pick a show to watch is, you know, I look at my recommendations, and then I go, oh, that, that was kind of interesting here. I read the blurb for it. Um, I, you know, I look at it, and then down on the on that page, I see all more things like lie to me. I check these things out. I browse it on for five minutes. And then eventually, I pick the show that during my short browsing session, I like the best. So maybe I pick both. Right? So what I've just told Netflix is that in the particular context that I was in now, I liked Bones better than Lewis Black. So I gave Netflix a preference statement where I identified something that was better than the prediction that they made. Here's another example. Put in the query SVM, I click on this link, and now <laughs> what Google could infer from this is, you know, Torsten would have liked this ranking better if I had just promoted this link by one. Basically, any possible measure of retrieval performance would tell me that that is an improvement. So again, I give a preference saying that this ranking promoted by one is better than the ranking that you presented to me. Here's my dad issuing the query SVM. Uh, my dad doesn't click on anything, reformulates the query to SV mapping and to German software club, and then clicks on the on the home page. Right? So what this tells Google is that my dad would have liked a ranking better where SV mapping was originally uh, uh, inserted at the top of the original query already than the ranking that you presented. Right? Again, it's a preference statement. So more generally, what's happening here is, <coughs> let's say this is the set of all possible predictions why that the system could make for a given content. And the system makes this prediction here. Right? What the user then does, does a little bit of exploration, now exploration in the space of why. And then eventually, either through this kind of implicit feedback, we can infer that there's a prediction Y bar that had slightly higher utility to the user than what the system presented. <coughs> so we get an improved prediction Y bar that has higher utility than the Y that the system presented. Note that this is different from supervised learning feedback. In supervised learning feedback, you would expect that the user gives us the Y star, the utility maximizer over the whole set, kind of the correct prediction. That's something we can't expect to get. Right? The user can't browse the whole set. Now note that this exploration is different. This is exploration in the space of Ys, in the space of labels that the user does. Whereas what the algorithm did previously is exploration in the space of models. And uh, so now we're substituting exploration in the space of Ys for substitution in the space of models. And we'll see that that has a nice effect here. And you can have similar kind of preference feedback also in, in other applications. So for example, I often translate stuff for my parents. They, they don't speak English. So what I, what I do is, you know, I throw it, you know, a piece of English text, I throw it into Google Translate. And then I fix it up just enough so that it becomes understandable. Right? So this translation is better than that translation. But this is not the best translation, right? So you get the same reference. So this leads us to this coactive learning model. Given a boundedly rational user that does this limited amount of um, exploration, um, that is a utility miser, fixed miser. Um, 
we have this for every loop. We observe a context x, like a query. Uh, our learning algorithm makes a prediction y. The user gets this back a y bar that's slightly better. And then our regret we define as the difference in utility between the best prediction, which we typically don't observe, is y star, and the prediction that the system made. That's our loss in the current iteration. And uh, then we just sum up all of these losses, and that gives us our regret. So note that we have a cardinal utility regret here, although we never observe cardinal utilities or observe the optimal actions necessary, these y stars. And you can put this in relation to other online learning models, like the traditional expert setting. In the traditional expert setting, you would ask users to label or to give us the cardinal utilities for all possible y's. That's not possible, right? Way too many y's. In the banded setting, you would ask users to give us just the cardinal utility for the single y that we predicted. But, you know, people can't tell us this ranking has a utility 7.8, right? At least not on a consistent scale over time. In the dueling banded setting, um, we ask the user to, you know, give you two options, y and y prime, which one is better. <coughs> and now in the coactive setting, we're giving the user one option, y, and we're asking, give us a better one, y bar, that's right. So those are the different feedback models. And I think whenever we're dealing with user behavior, it's essentially going to lead to preferences. Right? That's the only thing that we can observe. We can never observe this kind of cardinal. <coughs> Here's a very simple algorithm for the coactive learning problem. We, it's a percept one, basically. Uh, so we model utility in this linear way as a joint feature map between x and y. Uh, so just like, you know, this is just like in structure prediction, like in a structure SVM, for example. So it could be anything x and y here. And then the algorithm starts with a zero weight vector, observes the context, presents the current arc max estimated utility um, to the user. The user provides this feedback, oh, this is slightly better. And then there's the simple perception update, just a linear update. It looks similar to a multiplied perceptron, but it's actually different in two ways. First, the feedback is different. The regular perceptron would expect to get y star, the best possible, the correct label, then this is just a slightly better label. And the regret is different. Perceptron would <coughs> optimize number of misclassifications, whereas here we have this utility regret that we're <laughs> Look at um, uh, you know characterize what the quality of the user feedback is, and one definition is this definition of alpha informativeness. Uh, so let's say this is the utility of the presented uh, y, and this is the best utility expert gets. The utility of y. And alpha informative means the following: we say if this is the whole distance that we still need to kind of improve. Then alpha informative means that we go by a fraction of alpha towards the uh, optimum, so that our feedback has utility that lies in that range. So now you can, you know, tune the alpha, you can make it bigger or larger, and that kind of determines the quality, or characterizes the quality of your feedback. Now, always requiring that it lies in this region is too strict, right, that's never going to happen, so we can introduce slack variables that kind of measure how much this is violated. In this sense, you can capture any type of user behavior. So here's the type of kind of regret bound that you can get. Um, so this sum of utilities is upper bounded by a term that goes to zero at a rate square root of t. And uh, note that this is a margin bound, right? So the dimensionality of the feature space doesn't occur here. And that's unlike uh, kind of any other uh, uh, contextual linear bandits algorithm. So this can be very efficient in high dimensions. And then you have this term here that kind of measures the noise and also the model mismatch. So if, you, if your users don't behave according to this linear utility model, that's going to be captured there. And so you don't necessarily get zero regret, uh, but you get this kind of uh, converged to this term. And you can extend that in many different ways, but that's not so important. So let's see how well this actually works. Um, so we've, again, fielded um, this learning algorithm on our archive search engine. So basically, we've taken this coactive preference perceptron and, um, and built it into our search engine so that after every query, it would update its, uh, its ranking function um, and, uh, and learn this way. 
And so the ranking function that we used is this, uh, basically we have to assign a utility uh, to a ranking y given a query x here. And what we've used here is a very standard information retrieval setup. Um, you know, there's a linear function here, w times phi x y. Phi x y is a feature vector that matches the, you know, features that tell you how much a, a query matches a document, you know. How many words in the title uh, um, match, right? Uh, how many words in the author field match, things like that. About a thousand features that we came up with here. And then we combine all of these individual document utilities here. Um, just through this kind of DCG, discounted cumulative gain um, uh, uh, formula here, where these are decreasing discount factors in rank. So again, that's a standard information retrieval thing to do, and the nice thing about this is that computing the arc max over, these, uh, over this utility function, so the, the highest scoring y, is just a sorting by the individual document utilities. So you can do that very efficiently. That's important. How do we interpret feedback? We did it in a very conservative way. Roughly speaking, what we did was, if the user clicks on link at rank k, we say, <laughs> oh, a ranking where this was promoted by 1, if the previous one wasn't clicked. If the clicked link was promoted by 1, would have been better. Right. Any measure of particular type of performance kind of agrees with that. So we get this proactive feedback. This ranking would have been better than that one. And then we started from a set of hand-selected weights uh, and let the system learn with the preference, uh, preference perception problem. And that's this red curve here. Uh, this is the number of iterations, or the number of feedback iterations. And this is the cumulative win ratio. So what we did was, I think every you did five iterations of learning. And then one iteration where we interleaved the learned ranking with the baseline ranking that we started from. So this hand, hand selected weights. So basically every fifth iteration we get, you know, does the learned ranking win or lose against the baseline? And uh, so this win ratio says that, you know, if it's 50 50, the win ratio would be 1. If it's greater than 1, then the learned ranking wins more often than. Uh, uh, than the baseline ranking. And you can see, even after just a few hundred queries, it's already substantially better than the, um, than the baseline ranking. And in the end, it's better by a factor of about two. And this factor of two is bigger than any of the other observed differences in the previous experiment. Right? Even the, it's bigger than this difference between original and rand, which is a huge difference. So this it's actually a very substantial gain in retrieval performance. And it's done completely autonomously, right? And I think this is the, the type of application, not just search, but this is the type of application where these kind of very autonomous models of learning are most helpful. You know, the reason why internet search sucks these days is because nobody can tune it, right? You, you know, you're buying a piece of software that's not adapted to your collection. And even just a, a little bit of adaptation can do a, make a big difference. Now, web search is great because there's a whole house full of people and billions of ad revenues that funds this for people to you know, tweak the ranking <coughs> function in a, in a somewhat manual way. You know, but all the <coughs> other applications, um, you know, desktop search, any, any kind of personalization that you have around your house, would really benefit from this kind of fully autonomous approach. All right, so let me wrap up. So I talked about these online learning systems that interact with users, where a learning algorithm interacts directly with the user, and where the goal is to kind of improve lifetime performance. Um, and my argument was that you sh one should naively you know, take this data and just throw it into an SVM or a logistic regression. I might should actually think about what is the decision process that led to the observation that we had. Because the things that we observed are decisions of the user. They're not absolute feedback in any sense. And then once you have a good model and you can write feedback on it, you can design the learning. 
And it's actually here, um, you know, the, what, what makes this a really rich design space is that there are many different models of user behavior for different applications. And also that the learning algorithm has complete control and can run these interactive experiments. It's not an observational kind of learning problem. This is a very interactive experimental learning problem. So one can really think about how to collect the data as part of the learning process. And I've given two examples of, you know, um, how to take, you know, particular observed model of user behavior and design the learning algorithm all the way. But these are really just two examples in a huge design space. Um, and these are just some dimensions of the design space. So I think it's a, you know, it's an interesting area to do research. And it touches across, you know, I think three main uh, items, or three, three main questions here. And any connections between these questions uh, really is an interesting area for doing research. So for example, this connection between decision models and learning algorithms, I think is a great area for doing more theoretical machine learning. You know, given a certain model of how people make decisions, what's the optimal algorithm, the optimal learning algorithm for this type of behavior? Here's another interesting direction for more applied machine learning, right? Given a machine learning or design machine learning algorithms and see how well it actually matches um, user behavior in, in implemented systems. So I think there's a lot to learn there. If you really want to understand how our learning algorithms you know, are perceived by users um, and you know, help you, I think this is a great area. And then finally, this kind of connection here. Um, you know, we are the people who are building all, we, we as computer scientists are the people who are building all of these systems that you know, change our daily life, search engines, recommendation systems, uh, interactive robots that live in our house. So, we should really understand how people use these systems and how they want to interact with these systems. And this is what this art is about. So this, you know, actually led myself to very interesting kind of collaborations between people doing human computer interaction, between you know people doing behavioral uh, behavioral social science, and uh, also towards like economic and game theory, right? And I think you know. It's a little bit further away from machine learning, but I think it's still, I found it very interesting to work in this space. So, I hope you find you found this uh, interesting as well, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you for working on the test, I found this interesting, I'm sure I'm not alone. So let's have some questions. Uh, yes. So, uh, often the interface is designed so that it gives information to the user. Mm -hmm. What it's not designed to do is to collect information from the user. Exactly. So, I mean, this interleaving is the start of that, but you can imagine designing an interface which maximally extracts information. I mean, it may not be totally pleasant for you, so I wonder if you had some opinion on that sort of direction of design. Well, yes. So, I think you have to strike a balance between the two. Right. And I think the balance into leaving strikes this balance, right? You want to extract information, you know, you want to present good information to the user, right? And that's part of your loss function. And you, but you also want to extract information from the user. And you know, you're, you're basically in a sense paying for it, right? And you know, modeling this trade-off, I think that's the interesting part in this exploration exploitation problem. And that carries over into the design of the interface. So I, I think one really has to, you know, talk to HCI people uh, and think about how to design these interfaces in a way that they do both, right? That they collect information, but that they don't annoy the user in the process. And I think this, again, it's a very interesting design space. How to do this for, you know, any particular application, I think, is, a, is an interesting research question. Yes, so when I had to, well, when I worked with humans, I almost had to satisfy an ethics committee about doing experiments. Uh, me too. And at least computers, they, and Yahoo, do they have, or am I allowed to be experimented on by commercial companies, but not? 
Well, I mean, I, I guess the laws are different in every, um, uh, in every country. So when I do the studies, um, I have to clear them with my institutional review board, which is an you know, ethics committee. Um, I actually think our ethics committee is too lax. For a long time, they considered IP addresses not personally identifiable information, which I think <laughs> this is crazy. Uh, I think they've gotten around to now they consider it. So, um, so we have to make sure that you know, we're not revealing people's identities and things like that. Yes. How this applies to companies and what they are allowed to do, I think they, they have, well, I don't know. I don't want to speak for companies. But certainly, I mean, search engine companies do run experiments all the time, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, thank you very much for this. I was wondering when you are when you are dealing with the dueling bandits, you are you are in the uh, in the space of uh, decision functions, and uh, you consider a number of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the in the second part, you were uh, moving to the to the space of decisions, right? I mean labels. Mm -hmm. And then in this frame, there is what what they call the expected posterior utility. Mm -hmm. The, the Viapiani and then the Tillier thing. So, what do you think? So, these, these were all non probabilistic models. Um, okay. And um, uh, in, a, in that sense, I've kind of stayed true to my roots of uh, you know, support vector machines and loss functions and things like that. Um, one could do many of these things also in an expected utility framework where you would actually, um, for example, model the whole. Uh, distributions of decisions. So, like, you know, use something like a multinomial logic model um, to actually also model the randomness in the user's decisions. Um, that's certainly an interesting direction to go into. Um, and no, we haven't done it here. But it's certainly possible. Yeah, it's nice. yeah. One or two more questions? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. So, actually, I have two questions. So one is, I think that you are having a certain lag. So in the standard position theory, you make an action and you get some feedback in some things, but is it more like here in the batch actor firm and some other settings that you have to plan ahead much more further? Which is sort of a single shot or a single step. Early and maybe that also spends some more for you can get some more feedback. More interesting one is that you could say that is uh, I think generally it's awesome to push our, our community into this direction of getting something which other people can understand. So now I'm not saying let's go back to this completely understandable machine learning, but for example, connecting with all the economic models where you physically call the models underlying and you know, getting these two fields together I think is really awesome. I so, so first my comment is the population. <laughs> Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, there's a very rich set of models from economics. And, um, I, you know, I was just scratching the, the surface here, right? That's the very simplest thing that you could do. Um, so I, I think, yes, the, doing the research in that direction, combining economic models of decision theory with machine learning is, is very, very interesting. And I think it's also, I mean, there's econometrics as a field, right? Um, and, um, but I think what we are trying to do here as kind of pure scientists is actually different from kind of the core mission of the econometrics. And, you know, vastly overgeneralizing. <laughs> if, you, if you make comparison between fields, you always do. Um, uh, econometric models are typically used for, you know, things like panel data. And what you want is you want to kind of identify what the underlying process was that generated the data. So you, know, you want to use panel data to figure out, you know, or you know, kind of things like conjoint analysis to figure out um, would people like my computer better if it had uh, Bluetooth built, right? Um, and then you would go and build that computer, right, based on the on the answer that you get. So it's a kind of analytic model. You know, figuring out uh, what the utility function is. We are using maybe similar models, but in a much more engineering way. Right? We are not trying to necessarily understand what the underlying factors are. 
that led the user to a decision. <coughs> but we are trying to optimize the performance of our systems. Right? So we're using these systems, <coughs> and these learning algorithms and these models in this online fashion to optimize performance. And we care much less kind of an understandability of these models. Um, so for example, in a, in a search engine, right, what the weights of this ranking functions are that they're learning, we don't care as long as it predicts this ranking. Right? So there is a different, you know, as I said, vastly overgeneralizing. I mean, there's a different emphasis. Kind of similar to the emphasis between statistics and machine learning in general. So, so I agree, but I was wondering, so in, in, in Germany at least we have this discussion about the profiles and what does Google know about you or you know, other, we call it institution, but any other thing. So I was wondering whether the next step of even understanding and having what it follows <laughs> could be even interesting, but well, maybe not for the companies, maybe not to improve the search, but to improve the trust of the user into the search. Because they could understand what if I whatever want to call if I would have done that or so so I, I was not I mean just maybe in uh, and it would never say years many years that might be um yeah I think understandability uh you know I think it makes a lot of sense for example to have um, for recommendations to have some uh, you know, justification for why the system made a certain recommendation and explain this to you. I, I think that's that's you know, that, that's interesting. That's important. Um, it's a bit of an orthogonal question, I guess, to what 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 I was getting at. But I, I agree that it's important. I'm afraid we're running into the coffee break and the Zoom. Uh, if, uh, if there are very short questions, <laughs> a very short question, perhaps. Thank you very much for the. And my question concerns this interesting cohabitive learning, because in my opinion, if you want to use the exploratory uh, capabilities of user in order to, this cohabitive learning doesn't uh, uh, finally uh, constrain and bias a lot your search engine. So you, in my opinion, you need something more that is a, an incremental cohabitive, because uh, during the time, probably, the, the user, <coughs> the same user changes ideas and should explore more and more, and so... Right. Um, yeah, so there, there was this assumption in here that the utility function stays constant over time, uh, which is not true. Right? That, that's what's one of the simplifying assumptions. Mm. And if you can get away from that, um, that would be great. Okay. Yes. <laughs> one more question from Katarina. Oh, Katarina asks a question. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. It is, it is a short one. I just wonder whether you find auction mechanisms helpful when you have this. Uh, is uh, possibly an alternative to the dueling bandits, and I thought that some of the auction mechanisms might be of interest. Um. I mean, I guess if you actually wanted to get at some kind of cardinal, uh, cardinal utility, um, then that's what auction mechanisms give you, right? So you could. Uh... Okay, so I guess it's time for coffee, and of course, Thorsten will be around if you have more. Okay.